Chapter 9, What Lucy Saw. Susan and the two boys were bitterly tired with rowing before they rounded the last headland and began the final pull-up and began the final pull-up glasswater itself. And Lucy's head ached from the long hours of sun and the glare on the water. Even Trumpkin longed for the voyage to be over. The seat on which he sat to steer had been made for men, not dwarfs, and his feet did not reach the floorboards and everyone knows how uncomfortable that is, even for 10 minutes. And as they all grew more tired, their spirits fell. Up till now, the children had only been thinking of how to get to Caspian. Now they wondered what they would do when they found him, and how a handful of dwarfs and woodland creatures could defeat an army of grown-up humans. Twilight was coming on as they rode slowly up the windings of Glasswater Creek, a twilight which deepened as the banks drew closer together and the overhanging trees began almost to meet overhead. It was very quiet in here as the sound of the sea died away behind them. They could even hear the trickle of the little streams that poured down from the forest into glass water. They went ashore at last, far too tired to attempt lighting a fire, and even the supper of apples, though most of them felt that they never wanted to see an apple again, seemed better than trying to catch or shoot anything. After a little silent munching, they all huddled down together in the moss and dead leaves between four large beech trees. Everyone except Lucy went to sleep at once. Lucy, being far less tired, found it hard to get comfortable. Also, she had forgotten till now that all dwarfs snore. She knew that one of the best ways of getting to sleep is to stop trying, so she opened her eyes. Through a gap in the bracken and branches, she could just see a patch of water in the creek and the sky above it. Then, with a thrill of memory, she saw again, after all those years, the bright Narnian stars. She had once known them better than the stars of our own world, because as a queen in Narnia, she had gone to bed much later than as a child in England. And there they were. At least three of the summer constellations could be seen from where she lay. The ship, the hammer, and the leopard. Dear old leopard, she murmured happily to herself. Instead of getting drowsier, she was getting more awake, with an odd nighttime dreamish kind of wakefulness. The creek was growing brighter. She knew now that the moon was on it, though she couldn't see the moon. And now she began to feel that the whole forest was coming awake like herself. Hardly knowing why she did it, she got up quickly and walked a little distance away from their bivouac. This is lovely, said Lucy to herself. It was cool and fresh. Delicious smells were floating everywhere. Somewhere close by, she heard the twitter of a nightingale beginning to sing, then stopping, then beginning again. It was a little lighter ahead. She went towards the light and came to a place where there were fewer trees and whole patches or pools of moonlight, but the moonlight and the shadows so mixed that you could hardly be sure where anything was or what it was. At the same moment, the nightingale, satisfied at last with his tuning up, burst out into full song. Lucy's eyes began to grow accustomed to the light, and she saw the trees that were nearest her more distinctly. A great longing for the old days where the trees could talk in Narnia came over her. She knew exactly how each of these trees would talk, if only she could wake them, and what sort of a human form it would put on. She looked at a silver birch. It would have a soft, showery voice, and would look like a slender girl, with hair blown all about her face and fond of dancing. She looked at the oak. He would be a wizened but hearty old man with a frizzled beard and warts on his face and hands and hair growing out of the warts. She looked at the beach under which she was standing. Ah, she would be the best of all. She would be a gracious goddess, smooth and stately, the lady of the wood. Oh, trees, 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 said Lucy, though she had 
not been intending to speak at all. Oh, trees, wake, wake, wake. Don't you remember it? Don't you remember me? Dryads and hamadryads, come out. Come to me. Though there was not a breath of wind, they all stirred about her. The rustling noise of the leaves was almost like words. The nightingale stopped singing as if to listen to it. Lucy felt that at any moment she would begin to understand what the trees were trying to say. But the moment did not come. The rustling died away. The nightingale resumed its song. Even in the moonlight, the wood looked more ordinary again. Yet Lucy had the feeling, as you sometimes have when you are trying to remember a name or date and almost get it, but it vanishes before you really do, that she had just missed something as if she had spoken to the trees a split second too soon or a split second too late, or used all the right words except one, or put in one word that was just wrong. Quite suddenly, she began to feel tired. She went back to the bivouac, snuggled down between Susan and Peter, and was asleep in a few minutes. It was a cold and cheerless waking for them all next morning, with a gray twilight in the wood, for the sun had not yet risen, and everything damp and dirty. Apples, hi-ho, said Trumpkin with a rueful grin. I must say, you ancient kings and queens don't overfeed your courtiers. They stood up and shook themselves and looked about. The trees were thick, and they could see no more than a few yards in any direction. I suppose your majesties know the way all right, said the dwarf. I don't, said Susan. I've never seen these woods in my life before. In fact, I thought all along that we ought to have gone by the river. <clears throat> then I think you might have said so at the time, answered Peter with pardonable sharpness. Oh, don't take any notice of her, said Edmund. She always is a wet blanket. You've got that pocket compass of yours, Peter, haven't you? Well then, we're as right as rain. We've only got to keep on going northwest, cross that little river, the, uh, what do you call it, the rush. I know, said Peter, the one that joins the big river at the fords of Baruna, or Baruna's Bridge, as the DLF calls it. <clears throat> That's right, cross it and strike up hill, and we'll be at the stone table, Aslan's How, I mean, by eight or nine o'clock. I hope King Caspian will give us a good breakfast. I hope you're right, said Susan. I can't remember all that at all. That's the worst of girls, said Edmund to Peter and the dwarf. They never carry a map in their heads. That's because our heads have something inside them, said Lucy. At first, things seemed to be going pretty well. They even thought they had struck an old path. But if you know anything about woods, you will know that one is always finding imaginary paths. They disappear after about five minutes, and then you think you have found another, and hope it is not another, but more of the same one. And it also disappears. And after you have been well lured out of your right direction, you realize that none of them were paths at all. The boys and the dwarf, however, were used to woods, and were not taken in for more than a few seconds. They had plodded on for about half an hour, three of them very stiff from yesterday's rowing, when Trumpkin suddenly whispered, Stop! They all stopped. There's something following us, he said in a low voice, or rather, something keeping up with us over there on the left. They all stood still, listening and staring till their ears and eyes ached. <clears throat> you and I better each have an arrow on the string, said Susan to Trumpkin. The dwarf nodded, and when both bows were ready for action, the party went on again. They went a few dozen yards through fairly open woodland, keeping a sharp lookout. Then they came to a place where the undergrowth thickened, and they had to press nearer to it. Just as they were passing the place, there came a sudden something that snarled and flashed, rising out from the breaking twigs like a thunderbolt. Lucy was knocked down and winded, hearing the twang of a bowstring as she fell. 
When she was able to take notice of things again, she saw a great grim-looking gray bear lying dead with Trumpkin's arrow in its side. The DLF beats you in that shooting match, Sue, said Peter with a slightly forced smile. Even he had been shaken by this adventure. I, I left it too late, said Susan in an embarrassed voice. I was so afraid it might be, you know, one of our kind of bears, a talking bear. She hated killing things. That's the trouble of it, said Trumpkin. When most of the beasts have gone into me and gone dumb, but there are still some of the other kind left, you never know, and you daren't wait to see. Poor old Bruin, said Susan. You don't think he was? <clears throat> Not he, said the dwarf. I saw the face and I heard the snarl. He only wanted little girl for his breakfast. And talking of breakfast, I didn't want to discourage your majesties when you said you hoped King Caskin would give you a good one. But meat's precious scarce in camp. And there's good eating on a bear. It would be a shame to leave the carcass without taking a bit, and it won't delay us more than half an hour. I dare say you two youngsters, kings I should say, know how to skin a bear. Let's go and sit down a fair way off, said Susan to Lucy. I know what a horrid messy business that will be. Lucy shuddered and nodded when they had sat down. She said, such a horrible idea, such a horrible idea has come into my head, Sue. What's that? Wouldn't it be dreadful if someday in our own world at home, men started going wild inside like the animals here and still looked like men so that you'd never know which were which. <clears throat> We've got enough to bother about here and now in Narnia, said the practical Susan without imagining things like that. When they rejoined the boys and the dwarf, as much as they thought they could carry of the best meat had been cut off. Raw meat is not a nice thing to fill one's pockets with, but they folded it up in fresh leaves and made the best of it. They were all experienced enough to know that they would feel quite differently about these squashy and unpleasant parcels when they had walked long enough to be really hungry. On they trudged again, stopping to wash three pairs of hands that needed it in the first stream they passed, until the sun rose and the birds began to sing, and more flies than they wanted were buzzing in the bracken. The stiffness from yesterday's rowing began to wear off. Everybody's spirits rose. The sun grew warmer, and they took their helmets off and carried them. <clears throat> I suppose we are going right said Edmund about an hour later. I don't see how we can go wrong, as long as we don't bear too much to the left, said Peter. If we bear too much to the right, the worst that can happen is wasting a little time by striking the great river too soon and not cutting off the corner. And again, they trudged on with no sound except the thud of their feet and the jingle of their chain shirts. <clears throat> Where's this bally rush got to? said Edmund a good deal later. I certainly thought we'd have struck it by now, said Peter, but there's nothing to do but keep on. They both knew that the dwarf was looking anxiously at them, but he said nothing. And still they trudged on and their male shirts began to feel very hot and heavy. What on earth, said Peter suddenly. They had come without seeing it almost to the edge of a small precipice from which they looked down into a gorge with a river at the bottom. On the far side, the cliffs rose much higher. None of the party except Edmund and perhaps Trumpkin was a rock climber. I'm sorry, said Peter. It's my fault for coming this way. We're lost. I've never seen this place in my life before. The dwarf gave a low whistle between his teeth. <clears throat> oh, do let's go back and go the other way, said Susan. I knew all along we'd get lost in these woods. Susan, said Lucy reproachfully, 
don't nag at Peter like that. It's so rotten and he's doing all he can. <clears throat> and don't you snap at Sue like that either, said Edmund. I think she's quite right. Tubs and tortoise shells, exclaimed Trump. If we've got lost coming, what chance have we of finding our way back? And if we're to go back to the island and begin all over again, even supposing we could, we might as well give the whole thing up. Mraz will have finished with Caspian before we get there at that rate. You think we ought to go on, said Lucy. I'm not sure the High King is lost, said Trumpkin. What's to hinder this river being the rush? Because the rush is not in a gorge, said Peter, keeping his temper with some difficulty. <clears throat> Your Majesty says is, replied the dwarf, but oughtn't you say was? You knew this country hundreds, it may be a thousand years ago. Mayn't it have changed? A landslide might have pulled off half the side of that hill, leaving bare rock. And there are your precipices beyond the gorge. Then the rush might go on deepening its course year after year till you get the little precipices this side. Or there might have been an earthquake or anything. <clears throat> I never thought of that, said Peter. And anyway, continued Trumpkin, even if this is not the rush, it's flowing roughly north and so it must fall into the great river anyway. I think I passed something that might have been it on my way down. So if we go downstream to our right, we'll hit the great river. Perhaps not so high as we'd hoped, but at least we'll be no worse off than if you'd come my way. Trumpkin, you're a brick, said Peter. Come on then, down the side of the gorge. Look, 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 cried Lucy. Where? What? said everyone. The lion, said Lucy. Aslan himself. Didn't you see? Her face had changed completely and her eyes shone. Do you really mean? began Peter. Where did you think you saw him? asked Susan. Don't talk like a grown-up, said Lucy, stamping her foot. I didn't think I saw him. I saw him. Well, Lou, asked Peter. Right up there, between those mountain ashes. No, this side of the gorge. And up, not down, just the opposite of the way you want to go. And he wanted us to go where he was, up there. How do you know that was what he wanted? Asked Edmund. He, I, I just know, said Lucy, by his face. The others all looked at each other in puzzled silence. Her Majesty may well have seen a lion, put in Trumpkin. There are lions in these woods, I've been told, but it needn't have been a friendly and talking lion any more than the bear was a friendly and talking bear. Oh, don't be so stupid, said Lucy. D do you think I don't know Aslan when I see him? <clears throat> He'd be a pretty elderly lion by now, said Trumpkin, if he's one you knew when you were here before, and if it could be the same one, was to prevent him having gone wild and witless like so many others. Lucy turned crimson, and I think she would have flown at Trumpkin if Peter had not laid his hands on her arm. The DLF doesn't understand. How could he? You must just take it, Trumpkin, that we do really know about Aslan, a little bit about him, I mean, and you mustn't talk about him like that again. It isn't lucky for one thing, and it's all nonsense for another. The only question is whether Aslan was really there. <clears throat> but I know he was, said Lucy, her eyes filling with tears. Yes, Lou, but we don't, you see, said Peter. There's nothing for but a vote, said Edmund. All right, replied Peter. You're the eldest, DLF. What do you vote for, up or down? Down, said the dwarf. I know nothing about Aslan. 
But I do know that if we turn left and follow the gorge up, it might lead us all day before we found a place where we could cross it. Whereas if we turn right and go down, we're bound to reach the Great River in about a couple of hours. And if there are any real lions about, we want to go away from them, not towards them. <clears throat> what do you say, Susan? Don't be angry, Lou, said Susan. But I do think we should go down. I'm dead tired. Do let's get out of this wretched wood into the open as quick as we can. And none of us except you saw anything. <clears throat> Edmund, said Peter. Well, there's just this, said Edmund, speaking quickly and turning a little red. When we first discovered Narnia a year ago, or a thousand years ago, whichever it is, it was Lucy who discovered it first, and none of us would believe her. I was the worst of the lot, I know, yet she was right after all. Wouldn't it be fair to believe her this time? I vote for going up. Oh, Ed, said Lucy and seized his hand. And now it's your turn, Peter, said Susan. And I do hope, <clears throat> oh, shut up, shut up and let a chap think, interrupted Peter. I'd much rather not have to vote. You're the high king, said Trumpkin Stern. Down, said Peter after a long pause. I know Lucy may be right after all, but I can't help it. We must do one or the other. So they set off to the right along the edge downstream, and Lucy came last of the party, crying bitterly. Chapter 10, The Return of the Lion. To keep along the edge of the gorge was not so easy as it had looked. Before they had gone many yards, they were confronted with young fir woods growing on the very edge. And after they had tried to go through these, stooping and pushing for about 10 minutes, they realized that in there, it would take them an hour to do half a mile. So they came back out and so they came back out and decided to go round the fir wood. This took them much farther to the right than they wanted to go, far out of sight of the cliffs and out of sound of the river, till they began to be afraid they had lost it altogether. Nobody knew the time, but it was getting to the hottest part of the day. When they were able at last to go back to the edge of the gorge, nearly a mile below the point from which they had started, they found the cliffs on their side of it a good deal lower and more broken. Soon they found a way down into the gorge and continued the journey at the river's edge. But first they had a rest and a long drink. No one was talking any more about breakfast or even dinner with Caspian. There may have been, they may have been wise to stick to the rush instead of going along the top. It kept them sure of their direction. And ever since the firwood, they had all been afraid of being forced too far out of their course and losing themselves in the wood. It was an old and pathless forest, and you could not keep anything like a straight course in it. Patch of hopeless brambles, fallen trees, boggy places, and dense undergrowth would be always getting in your way. But the gorge of the rush was not at all a nice place for traveling either. I mean, it was not a nice place for people in a hurry. For an afternoon's ramble ending in a picnic tea, it would have been delightful. It had everything you could want on an occasion of that sort. Rumbling waterfalls, silver cascades, deep amber-colored pools, mossy rocks, and deep moss on the banks in which you could sink over your ankles. Every kind of fern, jewel-like dragonflies, sometimes a hawk overhead, and once, Peter and Trumpkin both thought, an eagle. But of course, what the children and the dwarf wanted to see as soon as possible was the great river below them, the Baruna, and the way to Aslan's house. 
as they went on, the rush began to fall more and more steeply. Their journey became more and more of a climb and less and less of a walk. In places, even a dangerous climb over slippery rock was with a nasty drop into dark chasms and the river roaring angrily at the bottom. You may be sure they watched the cliffs on their left eagerly for any sign of a break or any place where they could climb them. But those cliffs remained cruel. It was maddening because everyone knew that once they were out of the gorge on that side, they would have only a smooth slope and a fairly short walk to Caspian's headquarters. The boys and the dwarf were now in favor of lighting a fire and cooking their bear meats. Susan didn't want this. She only wanted, as she said, to get on and finish it and get out of these beastly woods. Lucy was far too tired and miserable to have any opinion about anything. But as there was no dry wood to be had, it mattered very little what anyone thought. The boys began to wonder if raw meat was really as nasty as they had always been told. Trumpkin assured them it was. Of course, if the children had attempted a journey like this a few days ago in England, they would have been knocked up. I think I've explained before how Narnia was altering them. Even Lucy was by now, so to speak, only one-third of a little girl going to boarding school for the first time, and two-thirds of Queen Lucy of Narnia. At last, said Susan. Oh, hooray, said Peter. The river gorge had just made a bend, and the whole view spread out beneath they could see open country stretching before them to the horizon, and, between it and them, the broad silver ribbon of the great river. They could see the specially broad and shallow place which had once been the fords of Baruna, but was now spanned by a long, many-arched bridge. There was a little town at the far end of it. By Jove, said Edmund. We fought the Battle of Baruna just where that town is. This cheered the boys more than anything. You can't help feeling stronger when you look at a place where you won a glorious victory, not to mention a kingdom, hundreds of years ago. Peter and Edmund were soon so busy talking about the battle that they forgot their sore feet and the heavy drag of their male shirts on their shoulders. The dwarf was interested too. They were all getting on at a quicker pace now. The going became easier. Though there were still sheer cliffs on their left, the ground was becoming lower on their right. Soon it was no longer a gorge at all, only a valley. There were no more waterfalls, and presently they were in fairly thick woods again. Then, all at once, whiz, and a sound rather like the stroke of a woodpecker. The children were still wondering where, ages ago, they had heard a sound just like that and why they disliked it so, when Trumpkin shouted, Down! at the same moment forcing Lucy, who happened to be next to him, flat down into the bracken. Peter, who had been looking up to see if he could spot a squirrel, had seen what it was. A long, cool arrow had sunk into a tree trunk just above his head. As he pulled Susan down and dropped himself, another came rasping over his shoulder and struck the ground at his side. <clears throat> quick, quick, get back, crawl, panted Trumpkin. They turned and wriggled along uphill, under the bracken amid clouds of horribly buzzing flies. Arrows whizzed round them. One struck Susan's helmet with a sharp ping and glanced off. They crawled quicker. Sweat poured off them. Then they ran, stooping nearly double. The boys held their swords in their hands for fear they would trip them up. It was heartbreaking work, all uphill again, back over the ground they had already traveled. When they felt that they really couldn't run any more, even to save their lives, they all dropped down in the damp moss beside a waterfall and behind a big boulder, panting. They were surprised to see how high they had already got. They listened intently and heard no sound of pursuit. <clears throat> so that's all right, said Trumpkin, drawing a deep breath. They're not searching the wood. 
only sentries, I expect. But it means that Moraz has an outpost down there. Bottles and battle doors, though. It was a near thing. I ought to have... I ought to have my head smacked for bringing us this way at all, said Peter. On the contrary, your majesty, said the dwarf. For one thing, it wasn't you. It was your royal brother, King Edmund, who first suggested going by glass water. Oh, I'm afraid the DLF's right, said Edmund, who had quite honestly forgotten this ever since things began going wrong. And for another continued Trumpkin. If we'd gone my way, we'd have walked straight into that new outpost, most likely, or at least had just the same trouble avoiding it. I think this glass water route has turned out for the best. <clears throat> A blessing in disguise, said Susan. Some disguise, said Edmund. I suppose we'll have to go right up the gorge again now, said Lucy. Lou, you're a hero, said Peter. That's the nearest you've got today to saying, I told you so. Let's get on. And as soon as we're all well up in the forest, said Trumpkin, whatever anyone says, I'm going to light a fire and cook supper. But we must get well away from here. There's no need to describe how they toiled back up the gorge. It was pretty hard work, but oddly enough, everyone felt more cheerful. They were getting their second wind, and the word supper had had a wonderful effect. They reached the fir wood, which had caused them so much trouble while it was still daylight, and bivouacked in a hollow just above it. It was tedious gathering the firewood, but it was grand when the fire blazed up and they began producing the damp and smeary parcels of bear meat which would have been so very unattractive to anyone who had spent the day indoors. The dwarf had splendid ideas about cookery. Each apple, they still had a few of these, was wrapped up in bear's meat, as if it was to be apple dumpling with meat instead of pastry, only much thicker, and spiked on a sharp stick and then roasted. And the juice of the apple worked all through the meat, like applesauce with roast pork. Bear that has lived too much on other animals is not very nice, but bear that has had plenty of honey and fruit is excellent, and this turned out to be that sort of bear. It was a truly glorious meal, and of course no washing up, only lying back and watching the smoke from Trumpkin's pipe, and stretching one's tired legs and chatting. Everyone felt quite hopeful now about finding King Caspian tomorrow and defeating Moraz in a few days. It may not have been sensible of them to feel like this, but they did. They dropped off to sleep one by one, but all pretty quickly. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep you can imagine with the feeling that the voice she liked best in the world had been calling her name. She thought at first it was her father's voice, but that did not seem quite right. Then she thought it was Peter's voice, but that did not seem to fit either. She did not want to get up, not because she was still tired. On the contrary, she was wonderfully rested and all the aches had gone from her bones, but because she felt so extremely happy and comfortable. She was looking straight up at the Narnian moon, which is larger than ours, and at the starry sky, for the place where they had bivouacked was comparatively open. Lucy, came the call again, neither her father's voice nor Peter's. She sat up, trembling with excitement, but not with fear. The moon was so bright that the whole forest landscape around her was almost as clear as day, though it looked wilder. Behind her was the fir wood, away to her right, the jagged cliff tops on the far side of the gorge, straight ahead, open grass to where a glade of trees began about a bow, a bow shot away. Lucy looked very hard at the trees of that glade. Why, I do believe they're moving, she said to herself. They're walking about. She got up, her heart beating wildly, and walked towards them. There was certainly a noise in the glade, 
a noise such as trees make in a high wind, though there was no wind tonight. Yet it was not exactly an ordinary tree noise either. Lucy felt there was a tune in it, but she could not catch the tune any more than she had been able to catch the words when the trees had so nearly talked to her the night before. But there was at least a lilt. She felt her own feet wanting to dance as she got nearer, and now there was no doubt that the trees were really moving, moving in and out through one another as if in a complicated country dance. And I suppose, thought Lucy, when trees dance, it must be a very, very country dance indeed. She was almost among them now. The first tree she looked at seemed at first glance to be not a tree at all, but a huge man with a shaggy beard and great bushes of hair. She was not frightened. She had seen such things before. But when she looked again, he was only a tree, though he was still moving. You couldn't see whether he had feet or roots, of course, because when trees move, they don't walk on the surface of the earth. They wade in it as we do in water. The same thing happened with every tree she looked at. At one moment, they seemed to be the friendly, lovely giant and giantess forms which the tree people put on when some good magic has called them into full life. Next moment, they all looked like trees again. But when they looked like trees, it was like strangely human trees. And when they looked like people, it was like strangely branchy and leafy people. And all the time that queer, lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise. They are almost awake. Not quite, said Lucy. She knew she herself was wide awake, wider than anyone usually is. She went fearlessly in among them, dancing herself as she leapt this way and that to avoid being run into by these huge partners. But she was only half interested in them. She wanted to get beyond them to something else. It was from beyond them that the dear voice had called. She soon got through them, half wondering whether she had been using her arms to push branches aside or to take hands in a great chain with big dancers who stooped to reach her. For they were really a ring of trees round a central open place. She stepped out from among their shifting confusion of lovely lights and shadows. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes, with dark trees dancing all round it. And then, oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, with his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion. But Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment, and the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy. At last, the great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell, half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all round her. She gazed up into the large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. <clears throat> that is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not, but every year you grow you will find me bigger. For a time, she was so happy that she did not want to speak, but Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said, we must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're all so... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slanging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? <laughs> the lion looked straight into her eyes. 
Oh, Aslan, said Lucy. You don't mean it was? How could I? I, I couldn't have left the others and come up to you alone. How could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, and it, it wouldn't have been alone. I know, not if I was with you, but what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan. No, nobody is ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do? Gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? Asked Lucy. Certainly not at first said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again, and I thought you'd let me stay, and I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away, like last time. Now everything is going to be horrid, it is hard for you, little one, said Aslan, but things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for all us in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face, but there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan, and now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. He got up and walked with stately, noiseless paces back to the belt of dancing trees through which she had just come, and Lucy went with him, laying a rather tremulous hand on his mane. The trees parted to let them free and for one second assumed their human forms completely. Lucy had a glimpse of tall and lovely wood gods and wood goddesses, all bowing to the lion. The next moment they were trees again, but still bowing, with such graceful sweeps of branch and trunk that their bowing was itself a kind of dance. Now, child, said Aslan, when they had left the trees behind them, I will wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. If they will not, then you at least must follow me alone. It was, <clears throat> it is a terrible thing to have to wake four people, all older than yourself and all very tired, for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it thought Lucy. She went to Peter first and shook him. Peter, she whispered in his ear, wake up quick. Aslan is here. He says we've got to follow him at once. Certainly, Lou, whatever you like, said Peter unexpectedly. This was encouraging, but as Peter instantly rolled round and went to sleep again, it wasn't much use. Then she tried Susan. Susan did really wake up, but only to say in her most annoying grown-up voice, you've been dreaming, Lucy, go to sleep again. She tackled Edmund next. It was very difficult to wake him, but when at last she had done it, he was really awake and sat up. Eh, he said in a grumpy voice, what are you talking about? She said it all over again. This was one of the worst parts of her job, for each time she said it, it sounded less convincing. Aslan, said Edmund, jumping up. Hooray, where? 
Lucy turned back to where she could see the lion waiting, his patient eyes fixed upon her. There, she said, pointing. Where? asked Edmund again. There, there. Don't you see? Just the side of the trees. Edmund stared hard for a while and then said, No, there's nothing there. You've got dazzled and muddled with the moonlight. One does, you know. I thought I saw something for a moment myself. It's only an optical, what do you call it? I can see him all the same, said Lucy. He's looking straight at us. Then why can't I see him? He said you mightn't be able to. Why? I don't know. That's what he said. Oh, bother it all, said Edmund. I do wish you wouldn't keep on seeing things, but I suppose we'll have to wake the others. <laughs>